Today, we are very happy to have Professor Jens Eisert from the um, Free uh, University of Berlin. So let me first introduce um, Professor Jens Eisert a little bit. And so he received his PhD um, back in 2001 in the uh, University of Potsdam. And then um, after a couple of postdoc experience, um, he became a lecturer in Imperial College London in um, 2005. And he had a full professorship in the University of Potsdam um, in 2008. In 2011, he moved to the uh, Free University of Berlin. And uh, since then, he is working there and uh, had lots of excellent uh, results. So of course he won many um, different awards in quantum information and definitely he is one of the um, leading scientists in the field of quantum um, information processing. So today he is going to talk about uh, the uh, linear growth of um, quantum circuit complexity and uh, we are all looking forward to your talk. So yes, um, if you are um, ready, please start. Thanks very much indeed. Um, you're too kind. Um, thanks for the kind invitation to this great colloquium series. So the last time I think I was in Kyoto in flesh and blood, I had a wonderful and inspiring time for the workshop on quantum information, computation and foundations that brought together people in quantum information and in high energy physics. And some of the themes to discuss there will also be picked up today. So in this talk, as the title says, we will be concerned with quantum circuit complexity or rather the linear growth thereof and related topics. And before I get started, let me give ample credit uh, to these wonderful people here. I have had the pleasure to work on this with. So what is this all about? So in a way, this talk, we will go on a journey when we meander through the theme um, that is somewhere located at the intersection of high energy physics, holography, and the Wormel growth paradox. Then quantum computing in various readings and statistical physics and thermodynamics, even though it's probably fair to say that we are sitting in this talk somewhere here. So we'll be mostly inspired by ideas of quantum computing and quantum information, but we will hint at other aspects in particular to notions in, um, in high energy physics. So there will be two concepts that will guide us through this talk. Um, these are notions of circuit and state complexity. So on the highest level, complexity can be seen as a tool, as a, as a hammer, as a means to make sense of the enormity of Hilbert space in quantum mechanics. So yes, Hilbert space is big, it's, it's, it's huge. And notions of complexity can be a guide there. So one often reads statements about quantum computers operating in exponentially large Hilbert spaces, and this being the origin of the computational speed up over classical computers. And this is not entirely wrong in a way, but I mean, all known quantum algorithms um, like make use of that in one way or the other. Um, but at the same time, it's also not quite right. One has to appreciate that the set of states that can be prepared efficiently on a quantum computer is again, an exponentially small subset within Hilbert space. There have been works on the convenient illusion of Hilbert space, or we also worked on the convenient illusion of state space for mixed states. And there's a point to it in that one cannot access the entire abstract vector space efficiently. And one can kind of think of an onion of, of more and more states that can be reached with the least complex states sitting in the center of the onion. And there's kind of more and more complex states coming um, later in the, in the, in the onion. But Anyway, maybe it's a good moment to be a bit more um, concrete and uh, precise. So in classical computing, the circuit complexity of a computation captures, in a way, the number of elementary steps it takes to minimally determine uh, the outcome of a function. So the, the complexity of a Boolean function is the, the minimum number of basic elementary steps that are needed to evaluate the function. The, of course, the precise fine print will, will matter and will depend on the model chosen, but the notion of complexity provides a useful way to quantify the hardness of a computational problem because how the number of steps scales with the size of the input to the problem has often a rather weak dependence on the specific choice of the model. And then a computational task can be seen as being 
feasible or easy if its complexity grows slowly, like no faster than a, a, a low order power of the input size and it's intractable. Otherwise, as one says, or computationally hard. So the complexity separates computational tasks into easy and, 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 and hard ones. So a, 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 a reading of the famous church Turing thesis states that all reasonable models of computation give rise to the same class of easy problems computable in polynomial time, a statement that presumably also makes sense and can be applied to natural processes occurring in nature. Well, good, but ultimately, of course, the world is quantum. And um, similar notions of um, quantum circuit complexities take over pretty much immediately. They are motivated in pretty much precisely the same fashion, but we can also think um, in terms of more physics concepts that come into play, say when thinking of quantum phases of matter, where one would allow constant depth quantum circuits when going from one point in a phase of matter to another. So here's the key definition that's sitting in the center of most of what comes. So that's the circuit complexity as the least, the smallest number of two qubit gates from a given gate set that is needed to represent a given unitary so here in the exact setting, but I will say something about the approximate setting um, later. And state complexities as the, the least number of two qubit gates to create a given pure state from a fiducial um, state vector. This definition, or rather these definitions, make a lot of sense. At the same time, it comes at no surprise that they are notoriously hard to compute. So the, the, the problem already has a computational feel. It, you could prepare something and um, and undo it and do something else at later steps and so on. So it may, on intuitive grounds, be not surprising that this is um, computationally hard to find the shortest circuit within a certain gate set to represent a, a, a given unitary. And in specific readings, this has also been kind of uh, precisely um, shown to be shown to be true. So in particular, here is the kind of the related problem of the t count problem where it's known that the runtime of the best known algorithm for the T count that decides whether the optimal gate decomposition of a given circuit in terms of Clifford circuits, so um, circuits from the normalizer of the Pauli group and T gates, the Clifford circuits are usually seen as the easy gates that, that can be done transversely in, in, in photon recording computers and T gates on n qubits involving fewer than or equal to empty gates or more is scaling like given here that is um, exponential in the system size. Also related to this are the, the famous or infamous circuit lower bounds um, that, that come into play in a similar um, fashion. So complexities are important. They are kind of profound, they are meaningful, they are well-defined, they are um, intuitive in, 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 in many ways. They can also be seen as, as guides to organize unitaries and quantum states in all possible states in Hilbert space or all possible unitaries. So think of a diagram that where on the left-hand side, you have like the quantum states with the smallest complexity, say product states that can be prepared with unit depth circuits, matrix product states that in a staircase fashion can be prepared in a with um, linear deep, linearly deep circuits. GZ states that don't have much entanglement, but still, it's interesting to see that one can prove that they cannot be prepared with constant depth circuits. Multiscale renormalization has like um, a complexity of n times log n in the um, state complexity and so on. And there's like higher compl complex states on the, on the, on the right-hand side. <clears throat> for unitaries, you can think of like very shallow circuits, circuits for, for classical shadows. We just published a, a paper on classical shadows with log depth circuits and so on. There's variation quantum algorithms, quantum approximate optimization that's seen a lot in the literature, literature these days, for better or worse, like reasonably short circuits that can presumably be implemented on near-term quantum computers. There is unitary K-designs, polynomial random circuits that are kind of already on the, on, on the, on the right-hand side, and then par random unitaries that are known to be pretty complex in the sense that one needs 
a very large number, an exponential number of unitaries to well approximate um, the Ha random state. Good. Um, this is great. Um, for most of what comes, we will see, uh, we'll have a look at random circuits and the complexity of random circuits. And this is extremely well motivated. First, in quantum information, random circuits are ubiquitous, to say the least. Of course, they've risen to prominence in notions of random circuit sampling, where it has been shown that if you have a random quantum circuit and sample from the output, when you make a measurement in the computational basis, this is actually hard for a classical computer. It's, um, we can show that one cannot approximate up to a constant error in the total variation distance. Um, the, like, one cannot generate samples that approximate the output distribution up to constant error in the total variation circuit, in the total variation distance, whereas on a quantum computer, one can, um, can realize this, and this has been done to great prominence by a number of, of, um, players and, and, and people most prominently initially by, by the Google team. But they also feature as proxies for quantum chaotic dynamics generated by time dependent or time independent Hamiltonians. It's not quite the same thing, but there's a growing body of literature that kind of shows that random quantum circuits share some features of such actual Hamiltonian systems concerning their localization properties, maybe out of time ordered correlation functions or their scaling, capturing quantum chaotic features. So while quantum random circuits are not quite the real thing, they're often seen as, as models, as, as toy models, as proxies for notions of quantum chaotic dynamics. And this is also the kind of the mindset that we kind of follow for most of the rest of the of the talk. Otherwise, we are pretty general. We can think of bricklayer circuits where the, the circuits are arranged in this kind of bricklayer fashion. In a two-dimensional reading thereof, this was realized in this mentioned um, Google quantum advantage or quantum supremacy experiment. Um, but there's different architectures we can pick. We can think of like staircase circuits or, or random, random circuits where we would pick a random architecture, but then place um, random gates along uh, along the way. They could be looking like this and so on, but let's maybe stick to, to, to brick layer circuits for, for most of what comes. The point is, it's a random circuit in the sense that one has a layout as given, but then one draws high random unitaries from the two qubit unitaries and places them in the, in the circuit, takes another high random unitary, places them in the circuit and does this one by one and builds up this random circuit in this fashion. Now, in what follows, we will have a look at causal slices. That's not so important. That's how we catalog the depth of the circuit. These are certain chunks we look at. So the causal slice are set up so that there's a backward causal cone included in these causal slices, but that's a detail that's not really so important for what, 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 what comes. And, um, the question we will start from is the question, how the complexity of this circuit grows with the length of the circuit. So if we kind of draw fresh random gates along the way and they make the circuit deeper and deeper, how does the complexity of the circuit grow? Meaning the shortest description in terms of quantum gates given the, the, random, the random circuit. This is an interesting question in, 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 in many ways. It has grown to prominence, well, through quantum computing, of course, but also in the context of high energy physics and the holographic context, where um, this notion of complexity is actually much discussed these days in a reading of the complexity growth of thermal field um, doubles. So this has been, kind of risen to prominence by these gentlemen here, like Brown and Suskind. Suskind is one of the founders of string theory and is a very like um, eloquent and, and eminent scientist and a, and a flamboyant speaker. So there's this famous saying by, by Preskill that like, saying that whatever it is, Lenny has the ability to explain it beautifully. And um, he's like really a, a very inspiring figure. I'm discussing these, these topics in, in a very um, understandable and, and, and kind of 
colorful, uh, colorful way and having deep insights on, on, on the subject. Now, specifically, <clears throat> what is at stake is the complexity growth of thermal field double. So they are, they are pure states, pure bipartite quantum states with the property that for each subsystem, the reduced state would be a Gibbs state, a thermal state. And in the context of holography, thermal field double states are seen as being dual to so-called eternal black holes in anti-visitor space. Um, so that's from the context of AD, the ads cft correspondence. That's a correspondence between two seemingly different theories, namely um, anti-visitor um, gravity in the, in, in, in the bulk and the conformal field theory sitting on the, on the boundary. And such a black hole's geometry consists of two sides that are connected by a, a, a wormhole or what is called an Einstein uh, Rosen bridge, and the, the the wormhole's volume is seen to grow for a time that is exponential in the number of degrees of freedom of the boundary theory. And one asks, like, there is a kind of a dual property on the on, on the quantum side, and and like the question is, what is it on the on the, on the quantum side that would grow um, linearly in time until an exponential time to 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 then um, saturate and as discussed above, like random quantum circuits are expected to capture the, in a way, presumed Hamiltonian dynamics behind the, the horizon. And if they do, the, the growth of the wormhole's um, volume is conjectured to match the growth of the, the boundary state's complexity. So both are expected to reach a value after a linear growth that's exponentially large in the number of degrees of freedom. So in this context, it has been seen and conjectured that the complexity of random quantum circuits should grow linearly in time until an exponential time and then saturate. That is kind of sometimes seen as a as the brown suskin conjecture, although I should say it's rather like one brown suskin conjecture in the sense that the, 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 the various cited papers here are very inspiring and very, very deep in a way, but they're not fully specific on, 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 the, on the precise fine print and the, the kind of mentioned vari several variants of the theme. But one of the meaningful readings of this is that random quantum circuits should have a complexity growing linearly in time until a time that is exponential in the system size. So that here's the, 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 the conjecture again. And if you think about this, this is not entirely implausible at all. In fact, this is very intuitive. If you think about this, because if you start out in a, in a in a low complexity state and have a random quantum circuit applied to it, it seems perfectly plausible that you are having well that that you are conquering new territory in each step. It's like a random walk in this enormously large Hilbert space. So how unlucky can you be that you go backwards? So in each step, you're kind of um, go going to a new new place. And the likelihood that there's some redundancy involved that you kind of could have a cancellation is quite small. So you cannot compress it much. So the quantum circuit, the random quantum circuit is pretty much its own shortest description. So that given a circuit and then going, having this random walk in this large space, you couldn't find a much shorter circuit that does the same, like that captures the same dynamics. <clears throat> Until a point where you go to exponential times, then you are basically um, thinly sampling out the Hilbert space. And then there will be a saturation because then, of course, there will be cancellations and there will be no further growth of the complexity. That's brutally plausible and intuitive. But, um, and that was kind of the, the brown suskin conjecture. There's a linear growth until exponential time. And that's very intuitive, meaningful, and, um, and, 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 and well, plausible. Uh, this would mean that cancellations actually hardly matter, and one can think of a back of the envelope argument. In fact, Saskin did present such a back of the envelope argument in one of this, his papers on 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 the subject. <clears throat> but how can this be judged? How would we know? And this is like an enormously difficult question because at the end of the day, there will be cancellations. I mean, it's they may not be in, in like very dominant. But of course, there might be some cancellations. There might be a shorter description that might mean to have a, 
an entirely different circuit altogether to give rise to that given unitary. So because you can play with, with, with the architecture. So of course there will be cancellation. So how can you show that there's a, a, a bound that grows linearly in time or in the depth of the circuit in particular, since there's no way you can even make a, a, a plot or some numerical assessment to see how it's going because even for like tiny circuits, there's no way you can run a, a numerical simulation of a type to, to check out what's happening. And also there's no, no polynom polynomial time algorithm that would compute the complexity. So that seemed like a completely inapproachable um, question altogether. So how can this be judged? And it seems that there's no way we can address this question. However, this is precisely what we will do in this talk. Um, we will have a look at this question or in this first technical part. And um, we will have a look at the growth of complexity with the depth of the circuit. Although the complexity itself is a bit of a terrible thing. It's too much of a beast. So let's have a look at a slightly more forgiving concept, namely that of a dimension that we have a look at in a, in a, in a specific um, reading. So let's, I mean, I, I will not go into much detail. I said I would be like not overrunning in time, uh, but I will give you some hints on how this whole, whole thing, how thing goes. <clears throat> so we have a random quantum circuit and place random gates on the circuit. So in one way or the other, we will have what we call the contraction map, which is nothing but a placement of the circuits or, or, or the gates into the circuit. So there might be some map that realizes like the, 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 the kind of the, the choices of the unitary gates that we have in the architecture to give rise to a unitary in the embedding SU2 to the power of n, so the big unitary that is kind of acting in the, in the Hilbert space as, as such. So that's a kind of a, a funny set. That would be a reachable set of unitaries that we can reach by, by turning the knobs of the, of the unitaries in this, um, in the, in the kind of gates that we have. And this reachable set will be in, in this big space. It's a, it's a funny set. It's not a manifold. It's like very fingery and very funny. It's a set. And this set will have a dimension. And that dimension we call the accessible dimension of the set. This set is not a manifold, but it's what is called a semi-algebraic set. So what is this? So an algebraic set is a kind of set of real vectors that are constrained by polynomial equalities. And a semi-algebraic set is a, um, a set of real vectors that are constrained by a set of polynomial equalities and inequalities, say, take an, as an example, the closed unit disk in two dimensions. <clears throat> That's not a manifold, but the open disk is, and the, the unit circle is as well. And this dimension is basically the largest dimension of a manifold if you see this semi-algebraic set as a foliation of, of, of manifold. So two would be the dimension of this um, closed unit disk. Now there's a principle that does some of the heavy lifting for us. It's called the tarski seidenberg principle that seems also quite plausible, which says that um, the image of a semi-algebraic set under a polynomial map or polynomial function will be a semi-algebraic set. And it, it takes a moment of thought to realize that our reachable set is a semi-algebraic set in the sense, it, because there will be some, some polynomial function that kind of uh, reflects the placing of the unitaries in, 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 in the circuit. And the, the knobs we have and the unitaries are kind of constrained in, in one way or the other by inequalities and uh, um, equality constraints. So the, the reachable set will be a semi-algebraic set and will have a dimension in, 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 in this sense. So the next step is that the rank of this contraction map is important in, the, in, a, in, a, in a point, which is the rank of a matrix that approximates this contraction map linearly um, around this around this point. So this setting allows us to prove that the contraction map has basically the same rank throughout the domain, except a, a small number of funny points, a measure zero set where it's, it's not maximum, but for all other points, this 
contraction map will have the same effect maximum rank it, it can have. That may say, say may, may sound a bit awkward and a bit technical and, and so on, but it's a key insight because it puts the problem upside down in that we no longer have to optimize over all circuits to realize a given unitary, which we couldn't do anyway in polynomial time, but we basically only have to show that there are generic or sufficiently generic circuits that would kind of reach this maximum rank and, and then we would be in, 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 in business. So in, in slightly more technical terms, the, the low rank locus is a kind of algebraic set of measure zero. So it basically never happens, probabilistically speaking, and is close to the elite group um, topology. So equivalently, this the set of maximum rank is an open set of measure zero, and hence this accessible dimension is for almost all points this um, maximum maximum rank. And again, that's not a detail, but we put things upside down, and we have to just look at these kind of sufficiently generic um, situations. And um, again, this means that we have to identify a point x where r grows linearly with r, which is like the number of chunks which is basically the depth of the quantum circuit up to like some linear prefactor that doesn't really matter for us uh, very much. And what could be more natural than looking at Clifford circuits or random Clifford circuits that are very prominent in quantum information? They have been mentioned before. Clifford circuits, just to, to say this again, are like circuits from the normalizer of the Pauli group. So they would map Paulis upon Paulis upon conjugation. And the point is that one can take these Clifford circuits and perturb them a little bit and count the independent directions one can reach in this way. And one can do that because these Clifford operations would map Paulis onto Paulis. One can basically conjugate the Paulis along the way. Then one expands the small perturbations of the Paulis all the way to the end. And then one can basically count the independent directions one has in this, in this fashion. So that's actually the most tedious part of the proof, maybe not the deepest, but this is pretty tedious, but this can be done and we can kind of count the, the independent directions in, in, in this fashion. And putting this all together, um, one does find a lower bound of the accessible dimension. So for an architecture of RTL gates, that's the number of chunks that we have. So we assume that this Architecture consists of causal slices of, 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 of gates. Um, each of the architecture's accessible dimension is lower bounded by this number here. That's again linear in the number of R and hence linear in the depth of the, of, of, of the circuit. And then the, the, the final part is basically like an elaborate counting argument. I'm not going into details. It's, um, so what basically argues that if there was a circuit R prime that has less than a linear fraction of R, then and 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 would have a, a, an architecture that would have a, a smaller dimension than the one that we have looked at, then this would lead to a, a, a contradiction to see that every unitary or almost every unitary has a complexity greater than the greatest possible R prime. Um like and, and and hence we are in the in the kind of the, in the, in this generic situation. I should say that this last step has also been very much simplified after we had our paper out by a beautiful paper by um, Lee, a single author paper that um, came out on the on the archive that simplified this step in a in a quite um, stunning stunning fashion. Anyway, putting this all together, one finds that if you use a unitary that's implemented by a random quantum circuit in an architecture of the type you mentioned, for example, a brick layer architecture of a number of chunks, then the unitary circuit complexity is lower bounded as this quantity here, where we see a linear behavior in R. So that's linear in the number of chunks, so linear in the depth of the circuit with unit probability until the number of gates grows to T with this given number here, so an exponential number in the system size. In other words, there is a linear growth of the complexity, and that's not a counting argument, although at the end there is a counting argument, but this is like a, a rigorous proof that for random quantum circuits in this way, there is a, um, a linear growth of the circuit complexity. 
So the same bound holds for the state complexity in, in the same way. So the state complexity would also grow linearly in time until a time that's exponential in the, in, 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 in the depth. So that's, again, a proof of this conjecture. And again, we, we made use of these kind of somewhat unorthodox tools from some algebraic geometry and then this kind of um, argument with um, random Cliffords to, to make this happen. Again, it will linearly grow until an exponential time. It's also interesting to see to um, see the dependence of the size of the circuit, not the depth, but the size. This goes like one over L. Yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, for any size of the circuit, it will be growing linearly in the depth of the circuit. So again, linear growth in time until um, exponential time. So Suskin's conjecture was once again perfectly right. He, he was right. There's a, almost no compression, but some, but the lower bound that still grows linearly in, in, in the depth until an exponential. Yes. Time. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is this exponential time optimal? So this two to the core n? Is, oh, same I highly time? doubt that. I highly doubt that. Okay. Uh -huh. You I may mean, be missing something, but okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can discuss this later, but um, I, I, I doubt. The, I mean, also the, the slope is presumably not optimal, but we have the right behavior. So linear and, 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 and exponential. I doubt that these numbers are, are tight in any way. Thank you. So, um, so we have seen one can prove this conjecture. Again, that might not be tight, fine, but it is what it is. And it's kind of funny because that seemed implausible because one cannot compute the quantity and one cannot assess it. It's, it's pretty hard to, to capture, but the, this property one can prove that's kind of nice to, to, to have. And this paper just came out um, at the late mid last year and um, has been greeted with quite some attention. Anyway, um, let's have an interlude and um, mention a couple of points that may be worth adding to this. And in particular, um, the following is true. So. Yes, this can be seen as a fair resolution of the brown suskin conjecture in this reading, although one could argue like what's the real brown suskin conjecture. <laughs> I've seen people arguing about like about this, and that's maybe not so clear, but anyway, it's 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 one of the brown suskin conjectures, um, which is wonderful. And we are very happy about this result. But of course, there's other readings that may also make sense and that would one would like to see settled, and maybe the Greatest shortcoming of our result. I mean, I'm very happy with this and it's precise and rigorous and everything. So there's very little to complain about. But the greatest shortcoming in a way is that it would be nice to capture also approximate notions of circuit complexity where one doesn't want to have the unitary exactly represented, but only approximated up to a small error, say, in operator norm, which would be a meaningful way of capturing errors in unitaries. And that makes a lot of sense and um, that would be good. Although this seems to be a pretty notorious open question and we've been thinking about this very hard and it's very difficult to make progress on, on, on this question. I should say that um, of course there's kind of, I mean, as, as everybody working in high energy physics knows there's um, a lot of like intuitive understanding on, 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 on that. There's the famous concept of, of the Nielsen cost that um, puts notion of complexity into a geometric context. There has been the question of what way, like the cost, the Nielsen cost would be related to entanglement. People realize that the, the cost cannot be the same as entanglement because the, the cost can grow and the entanglement would eventually saturate. But actually it turns out that for small times or small short circuits in a way, there is a relationship between common notions of Nielsen costs like the L1, the Nielsen cost written as an integral and the entanglements in that entanglement lower bounds the cost in a certain way, which can be used for short circuits and even for obscure arguments that can lower bound the circuit depth that you need to have to generate certain probability distributions when you measure in the computation basis. I don't know what to do with it, but it's, well, in a way, it's still interesting. But this will not work for very deep circuits in, in very long times. Anyway, there's a bit of a connection between Nielsen cost and entanglement. I'm happy to say more about this, but this will not kind of settle the question of approximate notions of 
complexity in the approximate reading of the brown saskin conjecture for, for very deep circuits and, and, and long times. There is a way one could resolve this via so-called unitary designs. Now, um, the, the, the argument goes that the duration of unitary T designs at a depth of the order N times T would imply the approximate brown saskin um, conjecture. To remind you, unitary designs are tremendously useful tools. They're a collection of unitaries that look random, or more precisely, you would have a T design if the teeth moments or, or less would be uh, mimicked, like of the Haar measure, would be mimicked by this collection of random unitaries. So we'd have a two design if the average over this coll final collection of unitaries would give rise to exactly the right two mo second moments of the R measure and, and, and so on. And this is an interesting field in its own right. People are thinking a lot and also us of how deep random circuits have to be to give rise to unitary designs of a kind and how these designs can be anyway implemented. So how can unitary designs be implemented? And maybe I take a few moments to procrastinate a bit here, but again, don't worry too much. I will not be um, running over time. This one little thing that I can't um, resist to mention because it's a, it's a result I, re I really like it. It's kind of funny in that uh, the famous Clifford circuits, random Clifford circuits give rise to designs. That's a property that's much used of in quantum computing. They give rise to two designs and that's a lot used in all kinds of benchmarking, certification, whatnot. That's that's a common tool in, in, in quantum information and quantum computing. They actually also give rise to three designs and they gracefully fail to be four designs just by a, a teeny weeny bit, the unitary three designs. Now, if you have a random Clifford circuit, you can spice them up, you can uplift them to arbitrary order designs by applying T gates. It's well known, that's kind of bread and butter in quantum computing, that Clifford circuits that are seen as being easy and transversely implementable and fault tolerant computers and so on, and T gates, which are seen as being costly and you need like magic state distillation to get them going, never mind. They are together a universal gate set. So by taking a random Clifford circuit and putting in T gates, you uplift this to an arbitrary order design, say to an fourth order design, a five design, whatnot. But how many T gates do you need to uplift a random Clifford circuit to a, an arbitrary order design? Say you have a thousand qubits and you want a 27 order design. How many T gates do you need to add to make this random Clifford circuit a, for a thousand qubits at 27, did I say 27? 27 order design. Anyway, and, and, and I mean, this is meant in the, in a meaningful sense of approximation to be specific. This is meant in the, in the diamond norm for the experts. That's a common, the most common way of approximating designs in, in, in this fashion. So how many gates do we need? And the answer is a constant number of T gates is sufficient. That's kind of funny. You have a big circuit and you place a constant number of T gates independent of the system size. And this will uplift the, the random circuit to a 27 order design. Whoa, that's kind of funny. It's very unintuitive. And this paper just came out in the Communications of Mathematical Physics with a very technical title. It's a very technical paper. For the preprint, we couldn't resist calling the paper Quantum Homeopathy Works <laughs> as a joke, because it's really a bit like homeopathy where you have like a non-universal circuit and you, you place the medicine of the, of the T gates there, but you can amplify this arbitrarily many times. It never stops. And this kind of seed of universality goes all over the place. And with a constant number of T gates for an arbitrary number of N, you will get an arbitrary order design. So this kind of, you could infinitely amplify this medicine of T gates and still have an effect of, of, of the T gate. You see my point. It's kind of interesting that the number of tickets you need to get an arbitrary design is independent of the system size. Anyway, 42 minutes into the talk, and I promised I will not overrun, so I will keep the last part relatively short, but I will meditate a little bit on, on this, on like more operational readings of this. In particular, we can ask what thermodynamic implications this have. 
and also how a resource theory of uncomplexity can be defined, building upon the notions that we've elaborated on until now in this in in in, in this talk. And so here we'll take a, like a, a more hands-on perspective, and we'll ask in what way notions of complexity can see what we can do and capture what we can operationally to, do to a system, say in quantum computing or in thermodynamic notions like in heat engines where we may be restricted in our complexity in our way to manipulate quantum systems in a practical fashion. Now there's a lot to say about this, but um, I will only pick out one reading of this in order not to become too, too fanciful and too procrastinating. So this picture we've seen before, the kind of the complexity scale where the low complexity states are sitting on the left and the, the high complexity states would be sitting on, on the right. And one could argue, this has been also argued by Brown and Suskin, that there should be kind of a second law of complexity in the sense that if you start out with a low complexity setting, then by the own dynamics or the own... Um, yeah, the own dynamics, the, 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 the low complexity states would naturally go to states of higher complexity in, in time. So that's kind of the complexity axis that makes perfect sense for, for pure quantum states. But of course, there's also another axis, which is the, the entropy axis that would go into the realm of mixed states and would capture, say, how mixed quantum states are in a meaningful fashion. There's, of course, a second law too here, namely the second law, the second law of thermodynamics that will basically say that um, if left alone, systems would go to states that would appear as having larger entropy in, in, in time. And this is coming out of a question that asks like what processes can be performed by a microscopic observer. And the, the, the reading is that naturally systems may do whatever, but through a kind of a coarse graining or it's like a, a microscopic picture, systems would appear as if they would have more and more entropy in, in, in time. And that's a question that, well, many people, including myself, have worked on a lot. There's many readings also in which one can make this more precise of systems kind of having growing entropy in, 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 in time. And then we can put in a kind of computational spice here and ask questions of how computational resources that come in and how many computation, computational resources we need to carry out a process and how can this be captured. There's a middle ground between complexity on the one hand and entropy on the other hand. And we ask how complexity notions and entropy notions uh, precisely intertwine and come together. And that's kind of our theme in our last minutes um, that we have. And a good proxy, a good playground to discuss this question is so-called lambda erasure. That's the primitive of resetting quantum system or a collection of quantum systems to a fiducial state, like bringing them down and bring them again to the all zero state. That's a, an important primitive, of course, in thermodynamics, but prominently in, in computing, in quantum computing or classical computing, where the point is you have some system in an unknown state, you want to kind of bring it down to the, 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 the all zero state and reset it to have a fresh use of it later. In fact, in, in, in classical computing, Landauer heat is um, presumably a substantial fraction of the heat that's generated by computers. Um, it's not the majority of the, of, of the heat, but it's, it's quite as substantial heat. To be more specific, so if you have a, an unknown quantum state, this will have entropy, and this entropy has to go somewhere, so we have to dump some heat into some environment and to, um, to compensate for that heat, one has to apply work to the system to reset the system. And a reading of Landauer's principle says that one has to invest at least kt log two of work per bit discarded into the environment that is held at a temperature T to reset a collection or to reset quantum systems in, in, in this way. And that's kind of, kind of, in a way, coming out of a reading of the second law of the thermodynamics, if, if you want. You could also be more nitty gritty and more um, elaborate. So if you have like parts of the system in known states or in pure states, and there might be also correlations all over the place, a more refined and resource theoretical 
um, description of that would be a bit like that, where you would have your state, you could do a Schumacher compression that compresses all the mixedness into a corner, and then you would kind of reset that part, whereas the other part can be just, which is already pure, can be just set to zero with a certain circuit when there's no complexity constraint uh, whatsoever. So in terms of these hypothesis testing entropies, Lana Eurasia has been nicely captured also in the recent literature on quantum thermodynamics that looks at this type of question in a very precise and also nitty gritty way in a, in, in, in a good way. That's kind of the entropic reading of things. But of course, there's also a complexity reading of things. We can say, think of a, a pure state first that's given, it may have some high complexity, say, and we ask, what can we do to, to reset this to the all zero state? Now, there's basically two things we can do. First, we can just uncompute the state. That's me of a circuit, you, we could do basically you dagger, we just go backwards and then going backwards, we arrive in the all zero state. We uncompute the state. That's possible, but that my, might require high notions of complexity, but there's no work cost coming along with this. Or if, if, if circuits don't create cost work, then we could, you can just undo this at high investments of complexity. Or you could just say, ah, cut the losses, we just reset the thing, and then you can use Landa's principle to erase the system at little complexity, but you have to um, invest the, the work dictated by the Landauer principle. So that already suggests that there's a kind of trade-off between notions of complexity and um, notions of, of, of entropy. And um, that motivates us to define and study complexity-restricted notions of erasure. We have a state given, and you want to kind of maximize the number of zeros that you get out so that the rest is being reset using the Landau erasure. But now you are kind of restricted in your abilities in a very hands-on operational fashion in that you can only apply R gates of a certain set or of a certain type precisely in the way we've been discussing all the way through the talk of, of, of in a complexity sense. You can do R gates to reset and then you can kind of see how many pure or almost pure zero states you can get out in this kind of um, erasure process. That's guys, a very hands-on operation interpretation. It's the amount of work required to reset a state for an agent that can do at most R gates. So there's N as the maximum value and a kind of uh, complexly restricted notion of a hypothesis testing entropy, which is the, the kind of entropy that's in the, in the focus of, 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 of all this. Let's have a look at this new entropy quantity. There's a new paper coming out, hopefully anytime soon, that in a very elaborate fashion looks at all the properties of this entropy in a more mathematically minded way. It's a, it's a new hypothesis testing type entropy that accounts for notions of complexity. So it's defined over POVMs, Q, but not arbitrary POVMs, but POVMs that are restricted in having complexity at most R. So at most R gates are being used in implementing this P of M element. And there's a trace of Q that captures how mixed um, Q must be. And the eta in this formula basically takes the role of a success probability. This should be like close to unity in this kind of one minus epsilon prescription. So that's kind of how we think of this, um, of, of, of this entropy. And that's kind of the quantity that rules basically all of these processes as we defined. And it has also has a number of nice and cute features. It's, uh, it can be seen as a variant of the hypothesis testing entropy. It is um, monotonous in eta. Yeah, that's good to know. It's also monotonous in R. It goes down if R is being uh, beefed up. And that's also intuitive in the sense that if you have too short an R, too short a circuit, then the state you have appears highly mixed at this complexity scale because you can't undo the, the, the system. You cannot um, reveal that it's basically a, a pure state in disguise because you can't undo this. It's, you're too restricted. And it looks like a mixed state and you have a high Landauer cost. And if you go to large values of R, then you can basically just undo the circuit and you are basically back to the old Landauer cost in an unrestricted fashion. It's not unitarily invariant, but that's a feature of the bug in that, well, um, the unitary that you 
need to implement to show that something is unitarily invariant that may have a high complexity altogether. I would be cheating to allow for unitaries along the way to, to get something done. So that's a very natural property of, of this, of this um, quantity. And building upon this, one can formulate an entire resource theory of uncomplexity that kind of basically captures scrap paper, like clean paper in quantum computing that you can use as a resource to do a computation of a kind. And in the center of all this would be two tasks of uncomplexity extraction that tries to distill pure qubits from a given state where you try to get as much as many zero states out as possible or to good approximation with circuits that are complexity constrained to R gates. That's kind of the, the getting out task. And the converse task would be uncomplexity expenditure where you have like a number of zeros given and some junk and you want to prepare a state that looks indistinguishable to another agent from the desired state row, given a circuit again, that is restricted to have um, R gate. So that's kind of for people with a background in entanglement theory, these are like really entirely analogous to the, the system entanglement and the time at cost or the time at formation as the two endpoints of meaningful protocols in entanglement manipulation. Here, they're the, the kind of the endpoints in meaningful uncomplexity manipulation, if you want. And there's one quantity to rule them all, which is this um, new um, complexity constraint um, entropy quantity. In fact, this is yet another brown Zaskin conjecture. So, so many of them. If, if you want, there's another one that we, we, we solved where um, it was asked whether a resource theory of uncomplexity can be precisely formulated. And it seems to be the case. So, well, judge for yourself, we've set up a theory of that kind that can reasonably be seen as a meaningful resource theory of uncomplexity. And this is governed by one specific quantity that we also elaborate more on and study in great detail, namely this mentioned complexity entropy that has interesting properties in its own right. Yeah, 55 minutes into the talk, I think I should slowly come to the end. This, <laughs> this picture I could resist um, uh, to show. When I first gave a talk on like a similar talk on this subject, um, it was at CERN, at this um, institution that's run by, by most European countries, but also most countries in the world, in fact, that do, do, do science, um, set up in Switzerland. Um, I was giving this talk that was connected to notions of black holes. On the same day, my daughter gave a talk in high school on black holes. That picture here is shown from her talk. It's kind of funny. There was no, no, it was a pure coincidence that we actually both, my daughter and me gave talks on black holes on the same day, she in her high school and me at CERN. It was kind of a funny, a funny coincidence. Anyway, I think it's a perfect moment to stop. I said I would use precisely the hour and that's what I'm, I'm going to do. So in this talk, we looked at notions of complexity, of notions that capture how hard it is to implement the unitary, how difficult it is to implement, to prepare a certain quantum state. The high complexity unitaries are those that need a number of unitaries or a large number of unitaries to, 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 to reconstruct them or to create them. High complex states are those that again require deep circuits to prepare them from simple fiducial state vectors. And in particular, there was this big conjecture sitting around of the linear growth conjecture asking if you have a random quantum circuit and let it grow in the depth, what is the complexity doing as a function of the depth of the circuit? Is it growing linearly in, in the depth? And is it saturating at some point? And that was the conjecture and it was settled which is kind of interesting in a way because one cannot numerically assess this. It's very difficult to, to grasp this quantity, but we found a new twist of approaching the problem and in this sense, settling the linear growth conjecture, which is something that we were very happy about and they're pleased with as a, as a result, if I may say so. Maybe that's a stupid thing to say. Anyway, um, that's the strong part. One thing that we would love to settle and to solve, which we couldn't do so far, although we have worked quite hard on this, is to think how we can address approximate notions of this. I mentioned one via unitary designs, but that's a pretty challenging prescription because to show that these unitaries can be um, implemented with so short quantum circuits is not, not easy, but that might be an avenue towards this aim. Overall, I think 
that is a technical um, result that we would love to see, but presumably it requires other methods than the ones that we have made use of, resorting to methods and ideas from semi-algebraic geometry. Then, of course, something that's maybe most interesting to you, it would be now having said of this, it would be good to relate this back to the holographic setting and like interpret more what it all means and, and kind of equip with this rigorous result, like come back to the original motivation altogether. Then again, I mentioned this already, it would be good to again put this closer in context with the Nielsen cost that is very like, much seen and used in the high energy context in particular. Which is um, interesting because again, the Nielsen cost is also a pretty heavy beast that's hard to compute and so on, but it has a very nice kind of geometric feel, which is maybe the reason why it's popular. I mentioned one result that uh, relates approximate notions of cost with the Nielsen cost and also entanglement, but what well, is only a kind of a, a, a beginning of, 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 of this, we would love to see more of this kind and understand this in a, in a slightly better fashion. Then again, a shortcoming. We were looking at random quantum circuits. That's great. And um, people seriously see them as proxies for the real thing, which would be like chaotic dynamics that's generated by a time fluctuating or time independent random Hamiltonian. But it would be great to see in what way like random Hamiltonians would have a growth of this type. And what's the connection to quantum chaos to start with? This, again, we would love to see settled. And again, this is not so easy to settle. We maybe can discuss this because you seem to have too little randomness in the, in the process. So again, there's good evidence that we might need new tools to tackle the question on, on this level. Then you can think of complexity with measurements. In fact, we have done so. There's a paper coming out, hopefully not too late in the future what measurements do to that, like how you can think of monitored quantum circuits where you intertwine unitaries with measurements. There's something to be said. This is not the final word on the subject, but we have a bit of a baby step in this direction that hopefully will come out uh, soon. What's the connection to quantum error correction and to quantum computing? After all, there's the deep connection between random quantum circuits and complexity. You have to be complex enough so that a sampling of like outcomes of a, of a quantum circuit are sufficiently like uh, like sufficiently um, random so that one can make an argument that one could not approximate um, like sample from 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 distributions that are close to the anticipated distribution on the quantum setting. So there is some kind of vague connection between the complexity um, of, of of quantum circuits and notions of quantum advantage and quantum supremacy. Again. This should be fleshed out in, in, in more detail and more precise fashions. And it's the hope that the kind of the tools that we bring in here as technical tools kind of may provide a snippet here and there to kind of help and assist in answering these intriguing questions. And I think my time is precisely up and I promise to stay in time. So I will do that. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to questions you might possibly have. So thanks so very much for your precious attention. Thank you very much for a great talk. So yeah, thank you very much. So now it's open for questions or comments. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can just unmute your microphone and please ask directly to Jens. Okay, uh, can I ask a question? Of course. Yeah. Hey, so, um, yeah, I, you know, heard about this Randawa erasure long time ago, so I don't, I, I have only vague memories, so probably stupid question, but uh, so you compare this uh, Randawa erasure with some computational quantum circuit. Yes. And, uh, my question is, um, can you uh, implement this Randawa erasure by including some uh, Hilbert space of environment in some way, or are they completely different things? Ah, so in, 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 in a way they will implement, I mean, the, 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 the Hilbert space of the environment will be included, 
I mean, it's really the the kind of the the work you need to invest to to kind of reset a quantum system, and that and this kind of governs how much heat you need to dump in the environment through some process to reset a system, and that's kind of that was like um like made precise and and, and also popularized by Charlie Bennett in seminal work who understood early on like the information theory of computing and to the surprise of some understood that there's heat kind of that has to be dumped into the environment when you want to reset registers in, in, in a way but so as such there's not it, it's, an, it's a general principle for any process that would do that in particular any dissipative process and also any circuit but that it can include any circuit also including the environment so of course you're right that it's it's perfectly there and the 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 the, the circuit to do this is kind of unconstrained, but no matter what you do, there will be this bound that you um, that you can't overcome. And, and also the, the simplest reading of Landau's um, principle is also, it's very simple. There's a nice paper by um, by uh, Wolf and Reap, or Reap, well, I think it's Reap, it's a, it's a German name, um, who very nicely look at the kind of three lines and it's basically just the monotonous in the monotonicity of the quantum relative entropy that in, in, in three, four lines you show that there is this kind of bound to the heat you must dump into the environment to reset a quantum system. That's kind of very, very cute. But yes, the environment is included. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Of course. No. What is your daughter going to talk about today? Well, no, that's uh, not a question. And my real question is, oh, I have many questions, but on this counting argument based on very, very difficult mathematics, look, I didn't understand it, but it looked very, very interesting. So is there any hope of do, using the same method to compute the lower bound of some non-random circuit? So, ah. Which looks complicated or complex. And, yeah. um, po possibly, yes. So let, let, let's um, so yes, the methods are very nice and very powerful in a, in a way. So we were like delighted to to find them, so to say. That's the good news. Then, um, well, they, they also provide answers to questions that are very difficult to to come up with with other methods. That's also good news. Um, then they are not very strong. I mean, they have a very uh, very much of an algebraic feel. So I mentioned this a couple of times. This approximate notion. We would love to make progress there, but it's very, I wouldn't even know whether that type of method could have anything to say about this. Maybe, probably not, because that's very different in, 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 in the field. So it's all always about exact settings. So don't, don't think that this will do a lot there. Your question was a different one, namely, can we do this when there's maybe not no randomness? That's maybe too much to ask for, but less randomness. Right. The first answer is I don't know, mm -hmm. but there's some hope that this might work. So, I mean, I, I don't see this inconceivable that these methods here would have something to say on settings, say, where you have, say, Hamiltonians with fluctuating parameters that you trotterize and then look at the Hamiltonian dynamics in time, or even have one random Hamiltonian once and then let it go in time. That's very little randomness because you just have it once and then you let it go. And that's maybe the most physical reading of all that. And... I wouldn't give up hope that these methods have something to say about that. But um, no randomness, or oh, that's maybe a bit too much to ask for. Oh, okay. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, yes, can I ask a question? Totally. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for a very beautiful talk. So, uh, so do you have any comments on this Lloyd bound, which is related to some, I mean, slope of complexity growth? Somehow slope is bounded by energy. Ah, you mean yeah, often, that's also often I mean discussed in the context of holography and so on. You mean that of, of energy that must be invested in when implementing a quantum circuit of a type? Is that what you're saying? Or yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean the 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 so on an intuitive level, probably yes. On a quantitative level, I'm not so sure because like ultimately we are very happy to see a linear growth in a way and um yeah i would suspect that the slope we are having is not so much off of the real thing but i wouldn't quite uh -huh. know how to show this so 
it's not so obvious how how tight the bound really is. Ah, okay. And presumably one has to make this tight or have some argument on the tightness to make a quantitative relation to to energy in in in, in your sense. Ah, so I'm not quite sure whether this uh, maybe made more quantitative, although I would love to do that. But um presumably one would also need upper bounds of a kind that are more or less matching that might might uh, make progress here I, I don't know but that's a good question uh, thank you. Uh, so I have a, one more question about uh, also you showed the relation between you talked about also between uh, relation between entanglement and also complexity and that's as far as I remember you mentioned that when complexity growth is not so high I mean complexity is not that too too much then they I mean there are direct relation between complexity and entanglement is this correct? This is kind of correct. I mean, you, the, the, that's, that's, if you think of this um, Nielsen cost, when, well, there's, the Nielsen cost kind of sees this as a, as like the, um, you, you see like the circuit is being implemented by a kind of family of control Hamiltonians, where you kind of switch on and off the control parameters of the Hamiltonian. And then you take basically they are like the L1 norm of, of these control parameters that you need in order to realize the unitary and that's kind of your your cost of, of of the circuit and if you think about this this can be seen as the a kind of collection of potential entangling powers of certain unitaries and that again i mean it's 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 uh, pretty obvious to see that if you have a, a product state and you apply unitaries that you can't create a lot of entanglement with a unitary that's close to the identity if this, if this user is basically the identity, you cannot create much entanglement from a product state. It's more difficult to show that if you have a highly entangled state, this gate will again only add a bit of entanglement if the gate is close to an identity, yes, even yes. though it's brutally plausible, but that's more technical to show. But anyway, uh -huh. the, the upshot is you can really up like add up things. So if you have a product state, you can really say the entanglement over a cut um, can be realized by quantum gates that really add up this potential potential entangling power until the point you have you, you reach the entanglement value, which means that up to levels of entanglement that would sc scale like a square in the system size, you can bound the entanglement. You can bound the Nielsen the L one Nielsen cost by the entanglement, uh -huh. but beyond that, I have no idea. Ah, uh, I see. Thank you very much. That's very clear. Thank you very much. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, as I mentioned this briefly, for example, the, in, in, in my group, the question came up um, of, can you lower bound the quantum circuits you need to prepare certain classical probability distributions if you prepare a state and then measure everything in the computational basis? And that type of argument can again be used that there are circuits that need to be, need to have n squared complexity to give rise to that distribution. But purely conceptually, I find that huge, but I have no application whatsoever. It's kind of unpublishable because I don't know what to do with it. If you have an idea, let me know, because it's kind of nice to see that there are bounds to the quantum circuits. You must have had to generate certain distributions upon measuring. Anyway, it is what it is. Ah, thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, totally. Yes. Um, well, uh... In the first part of your talk, I think you said the complexity or cost is a lower bounded by entanglement. And uh, as far as I look at your paper, uh, the entanglement is given by the maximizing uh, over the all possible subregion. So that maximizes entanglement entropy or something like that. And yes. uh, do you, uh, can you relate the uh, minimal entanglement entropy instead of maximal entanglement entropy to complexity or cost? You mean the minimum over the different cuts or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, that, that is, yeah, of course you can. I mean, th th that's really one-to-one. -one. I mean, if you look at cuts, I mean, the, the, the upshot is, is, is very simple in that if you look at certain cuts, you really can kind of relate the entanglement over this cut with the potent, the added up potential entangling power that you must have had over this cut. So that goes for all cuts and all possible mins, max, and so on. That's basically one-to-one. -one. 
So the answer is yes. Uh huh. So can you uh, relate uh, any specific cost to the minimal value of entanglement entropy? Um, not really. I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't have a very catchy interpretation other than what I said. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I mean, if, if it's very little, if the value is very, if the value is very small, then over this cut, you need very little mm -hmm. entangling power to, to build up that entanglement. I think that's what it, what it, what it is. I see. Thank you. Yeah, but unfortunately, the notions of entanglement don't give you tools to study the approximate context, uh, the, the approximate entanglement growth. So you, you need different tools here. Okay, any other questions from anybody? Well, actually, I have a question, but um, um, I don't know. Maybe after uh, this um, official session, we are going to have a, like a free uh, chat or like free discussion time. If yes, it's uh, free, yeah. Nice. Um, so um, I should say that I have to go before like quarter to eleven or something because mm -hmm. there's a vibe of my student, and I don't want to be late, and I'm in a different building. I have to walk over there, but um, mm -hmm. other than that, I'm yeah, but some there. small time, yeah. Maybe you can yeah, have yeah, a free no, discussion, no. yeah. yeah. Uh, so, does anybody uh, have the uh, the last question you want to ask in this official session? Okay, if not, um, let me close the um, this session. So, thank you very much, um, Jens, uh, for a very great talk. Thank you.